Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. Let's pray together. Father, we come to you now to be fed. Uh, We are hungry. We live in a world, Father, that there is a lot of uh, discouraging things going on, a lot of painful things that are happening around us. And so we come to you, Father, hungry. We want to know of you. We want to learn from you. We want to receive from you. And so we pray now, Holy Spirit, that you would be in us and among us in a special way that we would hear these words, that they would soak into our hearts and our minds, that our lives would be changed, and that as a result, uh, the people around us would be blessed and you would be glorified. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. The goodness of God is something that we often don't think about until we're forced to come to grips with its implications. A few years ago, Becca and I found ourselves in a very unhealthy relationship with a Thai pastor. Many Asian cultures, Thai culture included, are what is called patron-client cultures. This means that the relationships often take on a little bit of a, I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine kind of a dynamic. For example, leaders will often go out of their way to care for the people that they lead. This can include things that, as Americans, we would consider outside of that leader's area of responsibility. They might help give someone a personal loan in order to get them over the hump until payday. They might pull some strings to help get people's kids into a good school. Or they might cover the funeral costs of someone's mother or father. In return, the person receiving this help offers this leader their loyalty. They work extra hard on the leader's projects. They give them an extra level of respect. In the business world, it can even mean that when a leader gets recruited from one company to the other, his or her entire network of people that they are caring for moves to the new company with them. When you have a good leader, this kind of relationship can bring people together in tighter, more trusting relationship to each other. It can build trust and deep respect between people and organizations. But like we found out, when you have a bad leader, it can lead to a horrible experience. The Thai pastor that we got to know ended up being a manipulator. He was using us to build a ministry empire that put him at the top and let everyone in the community around see how influential and powerful he was. We didn't know this when we got to know him. In the beginning, he was really kind to us. He offered to help us with the important parts of getting our lives settled in Thailand. He helped us open a bank account. He provided ministry opportunities for us. He gave us access to powerful people in the Thai ministry community. But not long after, it became time to pay the piper. He wanted our loyalty. He wanted us to do the ministry he needed done to build his name. And that often came at the expense of what is good and right. We once had an orphanage contact us and ask us to let their orphans worship at the church that we were planting. Now, this seemed like an incredible opportunity for our church and a slam dunk decision. He turned them away, saying having them around would keep the influential, wealthy people that he wanted in the pews away from our church. On one particular day, he did a lot of work to get us visas that would allow us to stay in Thailand. Near the end of the day, he made it very clear to me, now that he had helped with the visas, we would need to do the kind of ministry that he wanted us to do. That was the deal. This was a terrifying prospect for me. Sure, we could have visas that would allow us to live in Thailand for a long time, but at what cost? 
Would I be forever trapped under this man's increasingly hurtful and damaging influence? If he was already turning away orphans, what more would we be dealing with in the future? To be honest, it felt like we were doing business with the mob. Like I just asked the godfather for a favor, and now he was, I was waiting for the day when, he would be, when we'd be asked to return the favor, no, fa- no questions asked. Right? On one particular day, I was really wrestling, wrestling with the predicament. I remember very vividly because I was sitting on my motorcycle at an intersection waiting for the light to change. What should I do? Was it even fair of this pastor to expect this of us? Then the thought crossed my mind. Isn't there a way in which our relationship with God is like this? Think about it. Think about how much God has done for us. Think about how much we owe him for all he's done for us. In a very real way, we owe him our very lives. There's nothing he can't ask of us that we can refuse him. And then the horrible thought crossed my mind. How is this any different than the mob-like deal I seem to be making with this manipulative pastor? How do I know that God won't use my loyalty to him to benefit himself and destroy me? There are times in our lives like this crisis that I was experiencing at the time when we have to come to grips with what it means to trust God. We have to realize just how utterly dependent we are on him. He can literally make us or break us. But fear not, there's great hope in the answers to these deep existential questions. Psalm 100 helps us to see where that hope lies. The short answer is our hope is found in the character of the one in whom we put our trust. To help us find this hope, let's take a look at our big idea from Psalm 100, which is this. The goodness of God is the difference between utter hopelessness and deep, abiding peace, even in the most difficult moments of life. Let me say that one more time. The goodness of God is the difference between utter hopelessness and deep, abiding peace, even in the most difficult moments of life. Well, sometimes in order to see how, incredibly, how incredible our hope really is, it's helpful to take a look at what things might be like without it. So let's take a look at our first main point, which is, what if God wasn't good? What if God wasn't good? Psalm 100 is a psalm of great celebration. It calls us to shout for joy to the Lord. We are told to come into God's presence. The psalmist cries out, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. Clearly, there's something worth celebrating here. Something is going on that would move God's people to praise him, to sing, to pour into his capital city and worship him as a king. And we find the real reason for all this celebration in the final verses of the psalm, which say, for the Lord is good and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. The reason for all this celebration is the fact that God is good. His very character is based in goodness. His love and he is loving and that love lasts forever. He is faithful to his people from generation to generation. Long after we are ever on this earth to help and guide our children and our grandchildren, God remains here to care for them. The truth of God's goodness is critical to the rest of the psalm. Without it, there's no celebration. There'd be no singing. Or at the very least, the singing would be cruel and not celebratory. Let's look back through a few of the truths that we see in the psalm as though God wasn't good. In verse 2, we are called to 
Worship the Lord with gladness. The ESV says, serve the Lord with gladness. Imagine serving a God who isn't good. Every time he asks us to do something, we'd have to wonder what might be coming next. Will he ask me to do something cruel? Will it hurt me? Will it humiliate me in front of other people? Or imagine having to worship a God who isn't good. What would it feel like to sing songs to an all-powerful being who might destroy you for no reason? That's the kind of stuff that gives people PTSD. Verse 3 tells us, know that the Lord is God. This is a statement of power. It's identifying the Lord, Yahweh, as God. He is the Almighty One. He controls everything. There is nothing he cannot do. There is nowhere we can go to get away from his power. The psalmist then says, it is he who made us, and we are his. God is our creator. The same almighty, powerful God formed us and made us. And because he did so, we belong to him. He has every right to do with us as he wills. He gave us life and has every right to take it away again. As our creator, he sets the path of our lives. He determines our purpose, our value, and the reason for which he created us. There is no part of our lives that doesn't, that where he does not have complete say and control over. Now that's a terrifying thought if God is not good, isn't it? What on earth will he do with me? Where will he send me? What does my life even mean at that point? We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. We belong to this shepherd. We are in his pasture. There's no getting outside of the realm of his domain. Again, the shepherd decides how the sheep are cared for, what they will be used for, and ultimately, what is the purpose of their lives? When will they be over? And if that shepherd is not good, that's a scary prospect for those sheep. You might ask the question, Ben, come on, why on earth would we be going through this mental exercise? We know what the Bible says about God. Why would we even consider what things might be like if he isn't who the Bible says he is? I think there are two good reasons for an exercise like this. First, when we hit really rough times in our lives, it is possible for us to be tempted to question the truth of God's goodness. Maybe, like the situation I described earlier, your struggles will drive you to question this reality directly. You might wonder to yourself or to others, is God really good? But more likely is the possibility that you have to come to the grips with the weight of what you're entrusting to him. When we decide to trust God, we are putting everything in his hands, our lives, our families, our future, our hopes, and even our eternal existence literally depends on him and who he is. If he's not a good God, that's a scary prospect. Suffering and grief can push us to the point of wondering Who am I trusting here? Can I trust him in this situation? When that question pops into your head, I don't want you to be surprised by it. The second reason for considering what the world would be like if God wasn't good is that many, many unbelieving people around us have this view of God, even if they wouldn't be able to put it into those terms specifically. It's very common for skeptics to cite Old Testament stories of God condemning Israel, uh, commanding Israel to kill men, women, and children as examples of God being a horrible, bloodthirsty, vengeful God. They are saying when they bring those up, God is not good. When they believe that God is not good, words that we give them with the intention of drawing them closer to God can possibly push them away. 
When we tell them of God being our creator, they might only hear the terrible prospect of being responsible to an evil, in their minds, evil and violent God. When we talk about the joy of worshiping God, they might wonder why anyone would be so sick as to give praise to a God who, in their minds, does wicked and horrible things to people he doesn't like. Considering the consequences of God not being good helps us in times of suffering, and it helps to give us some empathy for unbelievers who are struggling to know and trust the God that we love. Okay, scary part over. Uh, It's good for us to consider what we'd be losing if God wasn't good, but it's far and away better for us to plumb the depths of the consequences his goodness. So let's do that by considering our second main point, which is because the Lord is good. Because the Lord is good. Scripture tells us over and over and over again that God is good. And this is on purpose. Absolutely everything else depends on this reality. Our lives, our families, our futures, even our very salvation depend on his goodness. Only a good God fulfills his promises. Only a good God fixes the problem of sin, even if it means he has to suffer and die. Only a good God is worthy of our trust. Scripture is full of examples of how God is good. And this goodness is described in so many different ways. Mark 10, 18 says, And Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good except God Alone. Now, I don't think Jesus is trying to say that there's absolutely no goodness in human beings at all. Clearly, those who trust in Jesus are growing to be more like God, including in his goodness. But what he's saying here is that only God is truly and fully good. Unlike God, we are stained and marred by sin. God's goodness is displayed in the things that he does. Psalm 119, 68 says, you are good and do good. Teach me your statutes. Psalm 73, verse one says, uh, tells us how God does good to his people. Truly, God is good to Israel, to those who are pure in heart. In Acts 10, 37 to 38, Peter explains the story of Jesus to the centurion Cornelius saying, You yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. Romans 2 verse 4 tell us that God is good to people in order to draw them to himself in repentance? Or do you presume on the riches of his kindness and forbearance and patience, not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? God's goodness is not limited, believe it or not, to those who trust and follow him. Psalm 145 verse nine says, the Lord is good to all, and his mercy is over all that he has made. Psalm 25, 7 to 8, show us how God's goodness moves him to forgive our sins and lead us in the way of righteousness. Remember not the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me for the sake of your goodness, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord, therefore he instructs sinners in the way. Because of his goodness, God protects his people. Psalm 31, 19 to 20 says, Oh, how abundant is your goodness, which you have stored up for those who fear you and worked for those who take refuge in you in the sight of the children of mankind. In the cover of your presence, you hide them from the plots of men. You store them in your shelter from the strife of tongues. His goodness is to be experienced and savored by his people as evidence that he can be trusted when we are in pain and suffering. Psalm 34, verse eight says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. 
Blessed is the man who takes refuge in him. One of my favorite verses about God's goodness says that God doesn't just protect us, um, doesn't just protect those who run to him for safety, he knows them. He understands what is happening around them and in them. He knows their fears and he loves them. Nahum 1 verse 7 says, the Lord is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble. He knows those who take refuge in him. We're familiar with Romans 8, 28, which tells us of how God's goodness plays out in his plan for those who he calls to himself. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good, for those who are called according to his purpose. One of the truths that helped me as I wrestled with our situation in Thailand came from 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 17 and 18. In these verses, Paul is discussing the trials of his work of bringing the gospel to the nations and the toll that it has taken on him. In the midst of all the pain and suffering, he holds out the following hope. For this light and momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. As we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. What Paul is saying is that the good things God has planned for us are far, far greater than any bad that we suffer in the work of serving him or living here. I like to summarize what he's saying here something like this. Someday, those of us who trust in Jesus as our Savior will stand in heaven. When we see all that God has prepared for us there, when we see a land with no sin, when we see him as king of his kingdom, when we see what he has been working in our hearts and lives, when we stand in the presence of Jesus himself, all the heaviness, all the pain, all the suffering, all the grief that we have experienced in this world, as deeply, deeply painful as it really was, will seem light and momentary. In fact, we will see all that pain was designed to prepare all that eternal blessing for us. In fact, when we see how infinitely greater the glory of eternity is than the pain and suffering of this world, without minimizing the depth of the pain in any way, we would be willing to go through that pain over and over and over again if it meant participating in God's glorious eternal plan for us. Brothers and sisters, that's actually the situation we are in right now. We can't see the glories of eternity right now. The struggles we experience are right now preparing the way for that incredible day. They are making us into the people that God wants us to be. They are spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ to the world. They are preparing for the utter defeat of God's enemies and ours. While we can't see the coming glory, we can have faith in that which we cannot see. On the day I sat on my motorcycle, waiting for a red light to change, wondering whether my relationship with God was any different than the change this manipulative pastor was making for me, God helped me to remember one truth that made all the difference in the world. God isn't a manipulator. He isn't a mob boss giving me gifts he will later use to destroy me. God is good. Because God is good, I can know that his plan for me is good. I know as my good father, he gives good and perfect gifts. He is all powerful. But because he is also good, he uses that power for my good. He will fulfill his promises to me. He will complete all the work that he set out to do in me. He will bring me to himself through trial, pain, grief, and tears, using each of them to shape me into someone who is ready for everything that he has planned for me. 
One of the gifts that God was working on that day, even if I didn't see it at the time, was a way to be free from the influence and manipulation of this problematic pastor. All while making a way for us to stay and work in Thailand. Even in the middle of the trials, God was using those trials to show us his goodness. Why would he do all of this? Because the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. But this only leaves us with one question. How do we respond to the truth that our God is so incredibly good? Let's briefly answer this question by looking at our final main point, which is life with a good God. Life with a good God. I think we find our answers if we just look again back through Psalm 100. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. We begin by shouting for joy. Joy. Did you catch that? Joy. The more we come to grips with the goodness of God, the more our hearts are transformed. The more we leave fear and embrace hope and joy. Even when surrounded by darkness, we can be joyful because we know that he is working all things out for good. And he is all good. But that doesn't just mean some of us here get to shout for joy, here in Oostburg. It should be all the earth that is shouting for joy. And so we let our joy share the good news of the goodness of God with all people from every tribe, tongue, and nation. We don't just shout, we shout for joy. We let the world see how we are different in how we see the world, how we live with joy no matter what is happening around us. Of course, of course we share the words that teach people the gospel of salvation in Jesus Christ, but we also let people see in us that our God is different. Despite our sin, he is good. He came to save us. He lived the life we should have lived. He died the death we should have died, and he rose again to give it to us all. And of this, and all of this creates such incredible joy that the world can worship the Lord with gladness and come before him with joyful songs. As we consider the truth that the Lord is God, he is all-powerful, and we find solace in that strength. When we smash headlong into the reality that we are so very weak, we don't need to fear because our eternally powerful God is good. And he uses his power for our eternal good. As his sheep, we can trust in his tender care for us. We live in his pastures. We are content with the grass and the streams he finds for us. We are thankful when he uses his rod to keep us where it is safe. And we stare, as we stare into the reality of our final days, we smile and celebrate the truth that precious in the eyes of the Lord is the death of his saints. We can trust him even in our death because he is a good shepherd. The good shepherd has already laid down his life for the sheep. And we know that after all this life is said and done, we will literally enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. The time we spend in worship together is just a foretaste of the thunder of the song of the people of God as we pour into his great capital city like we studied with Zach this morning, as we gather in the courts, in his courts for worship as we give thanks to him and praise his name. But why? Because the Lord is good. His, and his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues to all generations. Brothers and sisters, never forget, God is good. Amen.